Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Marshall Truth Podcast. Joint locks don't work, or do they? Um, I recently saw a video put out by a young uh, karate sensei where he appeared with an Aikido sensei who did a little bit more of a combat-oriented uh, type of Aikido, according to him. And in that video, he makes a statement that joint locks really don't necessarily work in uh, combat. Um, I trained with some v all the pretty much senior Ishinru sensei, um, first-generation students of Tatsuo. And uh, one of them on one occasion uh, said at a seminar, well, you know, Tatsuo taught these joint locks, but they don't really work. We, we just do them for like fun. Um, you know, and, and I've heard this refrain throughout the years. Joint locks don't work. Or we practice them, but just in the dojo because they won't work in a real fight. Okay, so couple of examples. I have a sixth degree black belt in Ishinru come into my dojo. At the time, I'm only Godan, and he wants to train in our dojo. And I said, fine. The first night I'm there, I show some joint lock techniques. He tells me in front of the students that the joint locks don't work. He says, like, they're, they're worthless. They're not even worth practicing. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, resist. You, you can fight the joint lock. And when he tried to resist, I did the joint lock. And he came up going like this. Oh, my God, I can't believe how the pain I felt. Wow, right? And I, I, I said to him, I said, joint locks don't work because the people that taught you jo joint locks don't know how to do them. Um, Konsetsu waza, joint locking, chinna, Whatever uh, word you want to use to describe the um, putting pressure on the joints to cause excruciating pain is a unique skill. And it's a skill that requires a lot of work. And the problem in the dojo is, remember, the dojo is the world of fake violence. You're in the dojo. No one's really trying to harm you. Um, also, when the guy grabs you and you show the joint locking technique to the class, it's very easy for the guy to resist it because why? He knows what you're going to do, right? So again, the good training partner maintains the, the mindset of he doesn't know what his partner is going to do. Well, I can't counter this because I already know what he's going to do. The sensei just showed the, just showed the technique. So now I'm going to really stiffen up and I'm not going to let him turn and, and do it on my wrist. So that sixth on initiator literally said to me, this was, I was the first person he ever saw that could make the joint locks work. Total nonsense statement. Um, I'm well-traveled in the martial arts. I do Chinese, Okinawan, and Japanese arts. Uh, I've trained in some Filipino martial arts. Not extensively. Just a dabbler. Okay. Um, I've studied uh, European manuscripts, fencing manuscripts, martial arts manuscripts. Um, every culture, every culture's martial arts have joint locks. So you can look it up. I think there's a book, um, it's very cheap, something along the effect of rough and tumble fighting. It was made like in the mid 1800s. It's very cheap on Amazon, you can get it. And you'll see in the illustrations there's joint locks, a European. Okay. Um, Indian martial arts, both American and India Indians martial arts all have joint locks. So there's joint locks in every culture. So with that being said, so what you're saying then is that joint locks don't work. Why does every culture have them? So the problem is it's not that joint locks don't work. It's that the people that are teaching you how to do joint locks and how you're practicing joint locks um, is not working. So, um, years ago, I went to Camp Donzenru in Santa Cruz, uh, California. 
And I met a guy, and for the life of me, I cannot remember his uh, last name. And if someone sees this video and remembers his last name, please drop it in the comments. But his first name was Don, and he was a police officer. Older than me by probably about 20 years at the time. And I meet him, and I get introduced to him, because obviously at the time I'm a police officer. So we're talking, and we're discussing techniques, and he's showing me joint locks. And he's doing the joint locks on me. And, uh, you know, I'd already begun to do joint locks on criminals who are obviously resisting and having a lot of success. The joint locks are working. I'm able to get them under control and put them into uh, uh, handcuffs to control them. So he starts showing me these joint locks, and his joint locks are exceptional. I mean, they're outstanding. So we discussed a few fine, fine points, which, again, made me think even deeper into the study of uh, joint locks. So at one point I said to him, I said, hey, uh, your joint locks are exceptional. I said, what do you study? He goes, oh, I, I don't train in martial arts. So I was like, I said, what, what do you mean you don't train in martial arts? Like, how, how'd you learn these joint locks? He says, well, years ago, I was going in an apartment on a raid. And when I grabbed the guy, for whatever reason, I managed to grab him and then put my forearm across his elbow. And, he, and created an arm bar, and he went down like a ton of bricks. And I remember being shocked at how the guy went down. And he said, so then I said to myself, wow, that was real effective. And, you know, he had obviously some tactical training in the academy, right? Um, and he decided to start experimenting with joint locking. And he tried all kinds of things. And he figured it out. And how he figured it out was why. He was also doing it for real. And when you're doing it for real, it's a game changer. Because you, you really are forced to understand um, the proper way to manipulate the human body. So, so I'll give you my first joint lock story. I'm a young police officer. I come down the stairs on a subway platform. There's two guys squaring off to fight. I notice one guy has a nail file protruding through his fingers, and he's got his hand hidden behind his leg. So he's waiting to punch the guy with the protruding nail file. He doesn't see me coming up behind him. I grab the wrist. I do a reverse kotagaeshi. The nail file goes flying. To this day, don't know where it went, but it's gone. Okay. But as I did that, he turned into it, and I had to reverse it to a standard kotegashi technique. When I did the kotegashi, it didn't work. He managed to push his other hand and push me back. So now I'm like this. And then I, I reached in and seized his throat and finished it. This was one of the most ego-crushing, soul-crushing experience I've ever had in combat or martial arts. Here I was, I had the best joint locks in the dojo, the best, okay? Now I do it, Kodagashi, which is a very common joint lock. Again, every place, Europe, every place has this technique. Didn't work. So the simple thing would be to say, oh, the technique's no good. Oh, that technique's no good. I'm never going to use it again. But me, I think a little bit differently. And I said, okay, it can't be the technique. It's me. It's how I'm doing the technique. So I immediately put it on my own shoulders. And I said, all right, I got to go into the dojo and I got to figure out why this is not working. So at the time, I had a student who was like 6'4", and, uh, you know, big, big guy, 250, 260 pounds. And he was a serious trainer like me. So we got together and... I just worked on this and worked on it and got his feedback, asked him what he felt like, asked him this, and I figured out what I think was the best way to do kotagashi in terms of for combat. I was always taught to step back when I did kotagashi. I realized that was a huge mistake. You'll see this a lot in Aikido. Um, again, works great in fantasy violence land, the dojo, the training floor. In reality, mm, not so good. Okay. Um, so I learned to step in on an angle, um, taking the wrist, very hard to resist. Uh, quick story, um, I couldn't go down to teach a seminar. I was supposed to teach down in Texas um, at an Aikido school. 
and I sent one of my young students down to teach. They wanted to learn the uh, Sosui Shido, the style of Jiu-Jitsu I teach. So he went down to teach, and uh, he taught a session, and they, they said, okay, we, we have a regular class now. We're going to teach Aikido. Do you want to train with us? He said, yeah, sure. And they said, oh, we're going to do um, counters. We're going to do counters to Kodagaishi, the basic wrist lock. He said, okay, great. So they said, all right, let's see your Kodagaishi. So he does Kodagashi on the instructor, and the instructor gets up going like this, and he says, okay, now that we know we can't counter your Kodagashi, we'll go on to something else. So just again, reaffirming that what I had figured out worked. There were plenty of times after my first uh, debacle with doing Kodagashi where I used it in combat, and it was highly effective. Um, you know, I, I can't even tell you how many times I used it. Okay. Now, again, does the person go flying in the air like they do in a jiu-jitsu class and take that nice fall? No. They just basically crumple to the ground. And if you crank it right and do the angle right, you're obviously doing some pretty severe damage uh, to the joint. Okay. So then I took the approach that I had to basically pressure test um, my joint locks. And initially, when I was trying to use them on criminals, a lot of times I would start with one joint locking technique to try to get him in a position to handcuff. And he would move, and I'd have to follow up with another technique. In the beginning, it might have taken me two or three or four variations to finally get him locked in, where I had him, he couldn't do anything, and I could put him in handcuffs. As I gained experience, as I gained experience, and I've handcuffed at least 1,000 people, because I've cuffed many people at where I didn't even arrest. It was somebody else's arrest. I got there, and there's a lot of guys, and so you had to help handcuff people. So I put handcuffs on over um, at least 1,000 people. And the thing to realize is most criminals don't necessarily resist by trying to punch you or kick you. They resist by just not letting you put them in handcuffs. So they resist with strength and, and squiggle around, do all kinds of stuff. So you have to figure out how to counter that, all right? So it's very difficult. I used to do a thing at seminars when I went, especially jiu-jitsu seminars. I'd take the two biggest guys in the room, and I'd tell them, okay, you guys have to put my hands behind my back, but you're not allowed to punch or kick me. And they'd always go, well, can we do joint locks? I'd say, yep, you can do anything except you can't punch and kick me. And nobody ever put my hands behind my back. Granted, I knew what they were, they, were, they were going to try something, but obviously once the criminal knows you're trying to place him in handcuffs, he knows you're going to do something too. So again, the problem was their joint locking skill was not at a, a level where it worked. They didn't understand the angles of the human body, how you had, where and how you had to apply the pressure. This is a very unique skill. It requires serious, intense study. Uh, one of the things you want to do is you want to find a student that will re resist a little bit. When he resists, you don't want to go fast because then you're going to hurt him. But what you do is you increase the pressure slowly and see if you can get it where he has to tap out. All right? Um, so angles are very, very important. So you've got to figure out when the hand is like this, what, how do I attack the elbow? So if my hand is like this, I don't attack the elbow straight up. It's actually on an angle this way. If my hand's like this, now the, the attack of the elbow is this way. If it's like this, it's actually down on a, an angle this way, okay? So if it's like this, now it's up. So really, you, you, you have to, and that's the problem. A lot of people, their angles are slightly off when they're doing the joint lock, and this is a huge problem. So angles are something you want to work on. To get them into the position has to be direct. Um, there's a lot of the movements are too big. Again, as you become proficient, okay, um, you got to watch it because you can easily damage a student. Um, we were training with Tang Su Yi, who at the time was ninth down in Hapkido. Very nice man, very highly skilled, okay. And uh, he was going to demonstrate a technique, which this, this joint lock here, right? And uh, he asked for someone to come up so he could demonstrate it. And someone in the class jumped up. And he looked at them. He says, no, no, no. And he pointed to me. He says, Mike, Mike. And he did it so fast that if I wasn't prepared for it and knew to go with it a little bit, 
would have 100% broke the wrist, broke my wrist. But he knew I was able to do that so I wouldn't get hurt. That's why he had me do it. And after he did it, he said, uh, he, I'll never forget his quote. He goes, uh, easy break, no easy fix. So, so that stuck with me, right? So some experiences with doing joint locks, some other things that are a problem is the grip. So the grip on Kodagashi, a lot of people push with their thumb, so like this. And then what they have is they have space. See that space that's in here? That's in here. See all that space? There can be no space on your grip. So if there's space on your grip, I'm telling you now, your opponent's getting out. He's just going to yank his hand out. And forget all the fancy counters. I love all the fancy counters, okay? There's no fancy counters in combat, okay? The guy you're fighting is a criminal, a low life, whatever he is, okay? And now you're in a life and death struggle. You think he's going to do a fancy counter? But when you go to do Kodagashi and he feels that jolt of pain, what's he going to do? He's going to try to yank his hand out. If your grip is proper, he's not going to be able to do that. Okay? So one of the things you got to do is you got to get in the Kodagashi grip, and you can do it with two hands. Hold, hold your partner in the dojo with two hands, and then tell your opponent, okay, yank your hand out. And if he can yank his hand out, you have to fix and work on your grip. You have to figure out the thumb placement, which should be the thumb placement on the main hand doing the technique should be just below your ring and pinky finger. And you notice how there's a flex in my thumb because I'm pressing in with the tip of the thumb. So I literally am pressing on the bones. Okay, this grip here, and this is another important thing. Okay, I'm giving you some secrets here. Normally I charge $5 for each secret. The grip starts with the pinky. So a lot of times I see people doing joint locks, I see a loose pinky. No good. So the pinky is the initial finger that squeezes and all the fingers follow up. So the grip is like this. There is no space in the grip. Okay? So how you grip, how you grip the elbow when you're doing it, how, how you're gripping different joints when you're doing it. You can even do joint locks on the knee. Okay, we have them in Sosuishu. Right, Jiu-Jitsu, where we attack the knee with a joint lock. Um, there's actually techniques in uh, some of the Okinawan kata, kusanku, where you could be attacking the knee with a strike and then follow up by a joint lock. So um, the grip and the angle, I can't emphasize enough. And you've got to figure it out. Okay? And figuring it out is very important. Okay? Um, forget this notion that joint locks were only taught as something fun to do. No, no, no. They are devastating. I, I use them, I use joint locks more in combat than any other technique. Why? Because as a police officer, um, my goal is to get you under control and arrest you and put you in handcuffs. And, you know, I, I used to tell people, you know, when I see a cop had to beat someone pretty seriously to get them in handcuffs, I completely understand it because they don't have my training. And, and again, it's so difficult to get someone to comply. Um, you know, years ago, I was asked to come in by the Newark division of the FBI, and they would teach uh, FBI defensive tactics instructor classes. And I would come in, and I would teach how to handcuff someone that's uncooperative. And, you know, the FBI didn't have, at the time didn't have a curriculum for that. They would surround, 10 agents would surround, and, you know, you'd give up, right? But... Cops, street cops, a lot of times it's one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's one-on-two. I mean, in transit, there were plenty of times where I was by myself or uh, where I had to cuff three guys. And I only carried two pairs of handcuffs. So the third guy, I'm in a, I got him in a hold. And I'm holding him until another cop gets there that can give me a pair of handcuffs. So, so things to consider. Um, I recently had a student come out and I was teaching a knife defense. And he was shocked at what, how he felt the joint locks. And he couldn't understand why my joint locks caused so much more pain. He'd been trained in martial arts. He'd been trained in joint locking. And he, he got mad because he said, here I thought my joint locks were good, and now I realize my joint locks are no good. And I explained to him why, and I told him, well, this is what you have to work on, right? But I'm going to give you some graphic examples of the difference between doing a joint lock for real and doing a joint lock in the dojo. So in the dojo, you do the joint lock, and when a person feels pain, 
they tap their leg, right? Or they tap you and you let go. That's supposed to train you to continue to follow through. So you don't, you don't stop until you hear the tap. Obviously with criminals, you're not going to hear the tap. And to a large extent, it works. It preconditions you to follow through on a technique till you hear the tap. But if your grip's wrong, your angle's wrong, there's still problems there. So what I will tell you is I um, did joint locks, like I said, hundreds and hundreds of times. Okay, Come along techniques, arm bars all the time, um, you know, wrist locks, varied wrist locks, a lot of arm bars, a lot. Um, you know, um, and a lot of come alongs because in transit police, we had what was called an ejection. So if someone was acting, uh, unruly in the subway, we could eject them and we were allowed to use physical force to eject them. So a lot of times I get the guy to come along. I also use a lot of UB Waza techniques where I grab the fingers and attack the fingers. And, uh, you'd be surprised. Um, if I was dealing with three guys, uh, and I would grab one guy's fingers and I'd make him basically do an Irish jig because the pain was so bad, when they saw me handle him by just holding two of his fingers, they usually backed off because it sent a message, right? Um, so some results of joint locks. Yes, sometimes broken bone, sometimes torn ligaments, sometimes dislocation. And the interesting thing is you could attack the wrist and the guy's elbow could dislocate. So the body goes at its weakest point. So some things to consider. These are things you don't see in um, the dojo. Some other things to consider is some criminals will not give in. Okay, so you can apply the joint lock, apply the joint lock. They still won't stop fighting. They'll take a broken arm and continue to fight. Because once the arm is broken, you have no more control anymore. The joint's broken. Now they're released. They've released that pressure, and now they can continue the attack. Okay, yeah. I know in the UFC... They get put in an arm bar, they tap out, it's over. Okay, that's the UFC. Criminals, very different breed. Okay, very different breed. Some of the other things I experienced was doing joint lock on someone and the pain being so severe that they literally crap their pants. And many criminals said to me they never experienced pain like that in their life. The pain was so severe. They literally crap their pants. This just didn't happen once. This happened several times. So their body, the shock is so severe from that pain, their body just releases. Okay? So it's a combination of fear. Fear and pain. All right? Um, you've probably never heard some, somebody say that before. But I'm telling you. Okay? I had cops with me. They experienced it. Right? Um, I had experiences where I went to grab a criminal who I was going to place under arrest. And as I went to place him under arrest, he started to resist. I started to do the joint lock, and he immediately said, okay, 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 okay. And he just put his hands behind his back. I didn't understand it at the time. We get to the precinct, he's sitting on the bench, and he points to me and says, I know who you are. And I was doing paperwork. I said, really, who am I? He says, you're that jujitsu guy. I said, what? I'm, I said, I'm no jiu-jitsu guy. He says, you're that jiu-jitsu guy. He says, a few months ago, I saw one of my friends square off with you. And he, you put him down so quick, I couldn't, remember, I couldn't believe it. He said, I've never seen anybody put my friend down that fast. And he said, when, when you grabbed me, I didn't recognize you. And then when I felt you start to apply that pressure, it hit me, oh my God, it's that guy. And that, I immediately knew if I tried to fight you, I'd be in big trouble. So working within the confines of the transit system, you're in the same stations all the time. So the criminal element begins to know who you are. So the word spreads a little bit. Believe it or not, your job gets a little bit easier because now they're a little afraid. Okay? So they're a little afraid where now if you tell them they're under arrest, maybe they won't fight. Maybe they'll just put their hands behind their back because they know they're going to lose anyway. And why, why, why risk the injury? Um, so again... It's not joint locks that are the problem. Joint locks 100% work in combat, 100%, okay? It's the way people are teaching them. Um, it's the fact that people don't want to develop them and really work on them to understand them because it's very difficult. It's much easier to punch a Makiwara and punch a heavy bag. 
much easier, okay? To be, learn to control the body through the manipulation of joints is a very high skill, very high skill and not easy. Um, give you an example. Uh, obviously, obviously, my jiu-jitsu sensei in Japan had very good joint locks. Uh, the police officer I mentioned, Don, again, I wish I remembered his last name, ex outstanding joint locks. Sensei Sherman Harrell from Ishinru, exceptional joint locking skill, okay? My Tai Chi master from Chen style Tai Chi Chuan practical method, Master Chen Zhang Hua, outstanding Chin Na, outstanding, okay? Um, so to say that, I haven't run across people in various martial arts that have a very, very high level of ability in joint locking. It's just not true. But I will tell you, um, most of the time when I see people doing joint locks, they're just not very good. And that's why when I see an instructor that has exceptional ability, I'm like, okay, good, this is good. At least there's a few of us out there. Um, again, I'm not talking about the joint locking where we're rolling around on the floor trying to get someone in a Kimura. That's for the UFC type fighting. I'm talking about in combat where you, you, you may have to control uh, the hand because there's a weapon in it. Um, you know, you may have to, if you're in law enforcement, you may have to control the person because your job is to control them and put them in handcuffs. Um, I will say I developed um, a series of two-person kata based on the techniques in Sosui Shiru. The interesting thing is when I developed the system of kata, I had already done all the techniques for real. So I was doing all the techniques for real in combat and I saw the techniques that worked and I also figured out, realized how the criminals resist. So that's what I did. I basically made the set based on what I was experiencing in combat. So it wasn't like I created this kata in the dojo. No, I actually made the kata in actual combat and then I just plucked the individual scenarios and created an uh, eight individual two-person kata set that I called uh, Taiho Jitsu, police arrest art. I actually demonstrated them for the headmaster of Sosu Ishidu in Japan, and he was shocked at how well they worked and how I'd used the jiu-jitsu techniques. I was also invited to the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Police Headquarters to train in Jodo. And while I was there, one of my friends, who's a senior kendo sensei, Japanese, said to them, um, that Michael also does Tai Ho Jitsu. So they assumed it was their Tai Ho Jitsu that they teach. And he said to them, no, no, no. He created his own Tai Ho Jitsu. So of course, these were the instructors, right? Japanese, but big, strong guys, right? And they said, oh, could you show us? So I showed him and I told him and he resisted fully. And I put him down, no problem. And I put him in a cuffing position. And he got back up and he said, could you try that again? Now he knows what I'm going to do, right? So I went to do it and I just adjusted my technique. And as he resisted, he was fully resisted. I put him right down. I got him in cuffing position again. He gets up and says, Chotomate, which means wait a minute. And he runs off. And I turn to my friend and he goes, he's trying to find a video camera. He wants to videotape your techniques. Couldn't find a video camera. No cell phones, right? Um, so, you know, they were shocked at how well the techniques work. I would have a supervisor in a certain unit might call me and say, hey, Mike, my guys are having trouble on the street. The guys are fighting and resisting. They're having trouble cuffing them. Could you do a few hour clinic and show, show them some stuff? So they'd come in, I'd do four hours. I'd focus totally on those cuffing techniques, how to manipulate the joints, whatever. Within, within a week, I'd get a call from one of those guys. Hey, you know, always Calandra, because cops always call each other by their last name. Hey, Calandra. How come I spent six months in the academy and the stuff they taught me doesn't work? And how come I spent four hours with you and I did the technique last night and I couldn't believe how good it worked? I said, because they're pressure tested techniques. I didn't create those techniques in the dojo. I didn't create them in a police academy. I did those techniques for real on criminals and found out they worked. And then I brought them into a training regimen. That's how real martial arts are developed. Hope you've enjoyed this. Please hit the like, subscribe button, comment, please. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, if you have any topics for future podcasts, let me know. I'll be happy to consider them and do them. Um, you know, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks.